Wise men say only fools rush in, for I can't help falling in love again. Should I stay, would it be a sin, for I can't help falling in love again. Like a river flows, surely to the sea, darling, so it goes, some things are meant to be. Take my hand, take my whole life too, for I can't help falling in love with you, for I can't help falling in love with you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, he's a lucky guy. Oh, thank you. We're all lucky. We're all lucky. Yeah. So, oh. and now let's welcome our real musical act, Steve McCormick and Heather Donovan. Uh, we are lovers. I mean, we are the lovers in the dark. Was it? No, here it is. We are all lovers in the dark. <laughs> Well, and this is the CD uh, available on the web page. Yeah. We are the lovers in the dark. <laughs> love, love me in the dark. It's all love. It's all about love, all right? Love. All good, baby. Yes, that's right. Okay. <laughs> that's exactly. Thank you. Well, we have a, a new piece worked up for y'all tonight mm -hmm. featuring Heather's beautiful, sultry jazzy tones <laughs> so let's sing it let's sing it i get along without you very well of course i do except when soft rain from leaves then I recall the thrill of being sheltered in your arms of course I do but I get along without you very well gotten you just like I should of course I have except to hear your name someone's laugh that is the same but I've forgotten you just like I should. What a guy. What a fool am I to think my breaking heart could keep the moon. What's in store? Should I fall once more? No, it's best that I stick to my dream. I get along without you very well. Of course I do. Perhaps in spring, but I should never think of spring. Oh, that would surely 
break my heart. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Oh my God. That was written by Hoagie Carmichael. Mm. Yeah. That's and I just read, I just read right now that it was based on a, on a poem that by a woman named Jane Brown Thompson. And it says, Thompson's identity as the author of the poem was for many years unknown. She died the night before the song was introduced on the radio by Dick Powell. But so here's, you didn't even know it, but that was tribute to a poet tonight. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank well, you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Dan Navarro is in the house. All right. He made it. And Alexis. I'll tell you more later. I don't want to interrupt now. I'm glad to be in. Sorry to be late. No, we, we just basically started, so. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, let's get on. Um, please welcome Sally Stevens. Thank you. Um, okay, this is just a silly poem. Hot sauce eyes. Okay, Buster, the jig's up. You with the hot sauce eyes, you gazing into the mirror of your own soul, admiring the reflection, I learned too late, you are not at all what you seem. You're just a hard-boiled, thin-shelled white dude, a bad egg, dyed golden, pretending to be something you're not, snuggled up next to those sweet chocolate bunnies. I got your number. You're that dinky little individual-sized ketchup bottle that comes on every room service tray, a hard to part with souvenir of better days. My fridge is full of guys like you a distraction offered by the management so no one complains about the size of the meat patty. We shared some pretty wild capers, you and I, some edgy dialogues, some chunky peanut butter chats. We floated through the world on a bed of whipped cream, leaving a high cholesterol trail wherever, where, wherever we went. You neatly groomed, your hair spiked like a broccoli floret. Yes, the apple of my eye, no doubt, for a time, and certainly the apple of your own. But in reality, when seen in the afterglow of freezer burn, you're nothing but a hillbilly, a corn on the cob kind of guy. Face it, the only reason you're still around is because parts of you got stuck between my teeth. And that was an assignment poem to use items in the refrigerator. So that's back in the world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, is Tina reading? Tina isn't reading, but Tina, are, are you interested in singing? Tini, are you there? She's still here? I would, but she has no audio. Oh. oh, oh. Well, maybe she can figure it out and come okay. back later. All right. Okay. Um, Suzanne. So for anybody who is not familiar, Suzanne runs this amazing series, They Write by Night. I have uh -huh. a couple of her books here. And uh, her noir poetry is, and series is just phenomenal. Oh, thank you. Thank you, really? Elena. Uh, Elena, I'm, I'm going to give you a choice. Um, I am undecided between, I have a poem in this uh, magazine called Ruminate. It's, uh, I like the poem very much. It's rather sad. It involves, it's sad, but I like it. And then I have one that is very acerbic and rather scalding and uh, not altogether polite. Um, and it's in spillway. Uh, what are you in the mood for? Well, go with the first one. The first one, okay. Well, I think that's a good choice. Thank you. Because I think probably it's the deeper poem. 
And it was uh, the editor selected this poem. She only selects one poem from each issue to showcase on Facebook. And this was the poem she picked from this issue of Ruminate. Um, just one more little note. I have a series of poems written to somebody I call O oh Best Beloved, which comes from Kipling's Just So Stories, where he begins his fairy tales, O oh Best Beloved. And so there is a hearer, and we never find out, is this an, a child? Is it a baby? Is it an adult? Or is she actually talking to herself and there's no one there? We never find out. Um, it's called For the Million. Oh, best beloved, now it's me who can't sleep. My brain too jammed with bits, most of them sounding out cries. Animals, the farmed and the wild ones, the hurts and the hungers, coyotes, sinew and bones stalking the nighttime streets of Northeast LA searching for cats and some troubles overseas all seven disturbances in the governing bodies i hear them like troubled stomachs roiling their devouring acids i'm sorry beloved but i do and no one nothing out there can i save not valerie race 24 bookstore clerk and bookworm prone to, quote, ta attacks of anxiety, like the one when she called from her basement flat in a borough of New York where she lived alone, called her mother shaking and crying, engulfed with terror. She couldn't say why. For a while, she wasn't seen around after that. Then she was on the side of an empty road when a guy driving for the public works stopped to open a large soup. Oh, best beloved, a poem can't pull anyone back from death into life, but it can pull the dead into a poem. Maybe she'll be safe here. That stranger, that friend, I mean, not her exactly, but her name, it will lie in the lines of this poem. Come, mm. calm, maybe it will sleep. And that was based on a real newspaper story about the murder of a 24-year-old woman named uh, Valerie Race. It's beautiful. I just have to say, I, I just read it yesterday again and uh, said, damn, <laughs> you know, that's a good poem. And actually, Ruminate is, is a wonderful journal. So, uh, um, yeah, I just discovered it myself. And it is, it is. Lois, have you submitted to ruminate no I'm, i will though you should i think your work and several other people here a lot of people here and a, both elena's and other people here i think and it's you know a big beautiful magazine hardcover um, quite lovely looking i made everybody feel sad i hope somebody has a an upbeat poem <laughs> thank you thank you suzanne and uh, hopefully you'll st stay maybe for the second round as well. Sad poems make me happy. <laughs> oh, ah, I, it, it, I understand that, I do. I, that makes sense, paradoxically. Okay, so now maybe we'll pass the microphone to Lois. Um, Lois P. Jones, was shortlist prize winner in the 2018 Terrain Poetry Contest, judged by Jane Hirschfield. Other awards include the Lascaux Poetry Prize, the Bristol Poetry, Poetry Prize, judged by Liz Berry, and the Tiferet 
Poetry Prize, with work thrice listed for the Bridgeport Prize and the National Poetry Competition. Jones has work published or forthcoming in Plume, Guernica Editions, New Voices, Contemporary Writers Confronting the Holocaust, Verse Daily, Tupelo Quarterly, and American Poetry Journal. Her poem, Reflections on Las Capigliata, was featured film poem for the 2019 Visible Pro Poetry Project. She's the poetry editor of Kyoto Journal and the host of Pacifica Radio Poets Cafe on KPFK. Her first collection of poems, Night Ladder, was published by Glass Lear Press. Please welcome Lois P. Jones. Hi, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming. Um, thanks to all the regulars and all the irregulars <laughs> that are here and not usually here. It's so wonderful to see all your faces. And I'm thrilled um, to see Linda and Margo and, uh, you know, people from different parts of the world and also different parts of the country. So I'm in. A, I have a little bit of a conundrum because um, the way it's set up, she has us do sort of two sets. So I was going to read from Night Ladder in the first set, but some of you who will be leaving have heard many of these Night Ladder poems. So I don't know if I should read from Night Ladder or read kind of some of the newer stuff. Um, any any votes? Read your Night, new work. Night ladder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one one vote for night ladder and one vote for new work. Another for new work. Another for new work. Okay, I will read the new work then. Three, and then I'll votes. do what's that? Three, four votes for new work, actually. Okay. <laughs> everybody's everybody's uh, tired of night ladder. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm tired. No. No, I'm just kidding. So, um, yes. So, I'm going to read you some poems from a collection that I'm, uh, I've just been working on actually a couple of years now, which is based on um, a <clears throat> memoir from the housekeeper of Rainer Maria Rilke who I'm sure everybody knows who he was. Um, and he, when the housekeeper lived with him for the last six years of his life <clears throat> in a place called Chateau Museau in Switzerland. And, um, and he wrote his great works there. He finished the Dueno Elegies and he wrote the Sonnets to Orpheus and other things. So I, um, as my friends know, I'm rather obsessed with this, <laughs> this poet. And um, I have visited his grave in Switzerland. I went there in 2017. And um, also I went to Museau. And I came across this wonderful memoir, which was written by his housekeeper. And it was in German. And I thought, how am I going to get that translated? And I asked my good friend here, Bill O'Daly, do you know any people who, anyone who might be good for this particular uh, project? And lo and behold, along comes uh, Ava West, who's here tonight. And um, she is actually from not too far from the region where the housekeeper was born. And she lives in Northern California. Anyway, she translated it. She's done a beautiful translation. And her and I uh, spent some time in Switzerland together and went to Museau and all of that. And, um, and so I've been writing these persona poems from the viewpoint of the housekeeper. And so you can imagine that this woman, it's 1921. Um, she 
has traveled on a train to live in this 13th century um, chateau that has no running water, no electricity. Um, she doesn't know, you know, she's moving in with the poet, but, um, you know, poets are risky. I mean, who knows what could happen? So, um, <laughs> so anyway, it was a very odd situation for her, but she kind of fudged her way in because she really didn't have too much experience. She didn't know how to cook or anything, but somehow she got through all these applicants and they hired her to live in this house with him. So, um, so I will start out with one of the first poems and it's actually the title poem of the manuscript called A Stranger's Needs. And it has a quote from her and she says, Chateau Museau was extremely primitive the rooms were comfortable, but there was no electricity and no running water in the house. In the beginning, I knew nothing. Not of the steel pots that required constant scrubbing or the way to press a shirt of linen. Wait for the iron to smell like burnt leaves on an October morning. Not of how to bathe in a castle without plumbing, cotton cloth dipped in an icy pail of water, a dab of lavender soap to scent the skin. Nothing of how to undress by paraffin lamp in the cold dawn of December or the desires of a body at 26, all of me rising from the belly. I had to learn to be invisible he wanted another Lenny, a woman who walked like a cat by moonlight and understood his needs with a single look. How could I find my way to a man who has no map? Sometimes I would say to the mirror, this is not the life you promised. Sometimes I would say to the bed, someone will carry me like a candle to their chapel. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, so I'll read a few of these. So this one, <laughs> uh, Frida is, you know, she's sometimes there in the winter months. She's there all by herself and she's waiting for him. He's off in Paris. He's off wherever. And she spends a lot of time on her home. On her. She has a lot of longing. So this is called Housekeeping, Frida's Future Kiss. <laughs> After the palm reader told her no man would ever claim her, she asked to be claimed by the white horse she dreamt of each evening. It always began with a nuzzle, a warm breath, like a kiss made of clouds that hovered and finally released its rain as if life only existed in the closed rooms of her eyes. And there, the scent of crushed grapes and the white shadow of a horse becoming human. Not a satyr, but a transmogrification like a moon impersonating street lamp, a tenderness that lived inside the small of her waist, his hand, this gentleness, and the tongues that mix their silence. She does not need her knees, fingers, thighs, saliva, only this window where she looks into the mind's vanishing frame. A flutter like a valve opens and he turns to her, their love like silk sheets toppling over the wicker basket. And interestingly, um, so she never married. She never married. She lived with him after he died. Um, she was gone for a little while, but she came back and 
she spent her life there as kind of a person that people would go to, you know, to ask questions about him. And I guess they had tours at that point, you know, for the house and things like that. But, you know, part of me feels that that connection with him ran very deep. So this is called Mino the cat. They had a cat named Mino. And, um, and Rilke has a quote here at the top of the poem. One night, a very cold night, I think it was still December, Frida, who's the housekeeper, had forgotten her out in the snow. I did not forget her. I swallowed her yowls, her swollen calls, the pacing of her paws, pause until my tail flicked to one side and I was out the door. I remember how you once entered the body of an animal. Your sight ran ahead like a dog and you looked up at your mother through those thwung doors that opened into your inner forest. You were a child then. You told your mother and she was frightened. You never trusted her again. I circled the house, trying to find some hole I could slip through and climbed up the plum tree, then leapt onto your balcony. You were woken by my voice, half plaintive, half angry. And what if I asked you to come inside this body and move with me through the house, our paws padding out the silence, our silence a padded room where no body enters. You always wanted a sister, a woman with whom you could be so close. Let me be that soul you can mirror, moving through me, unattached to what moves. Okay. And, and here she is. Um, she was very tall. And and, and Rilke said that she had somewhat a voice like a wounded animal, <laughs> poor thing. <laughs> and, so, um, and so this is called, um, only the moon holds her exits and entrances. I don't believe what my body says. The whole of me too tall for most men, my voice, a wounded animal, a body that holds forks and knives and pokers for the fire, blue coals alive as dust. I don't believe it's cries and moans and cracks of thunder hush between the lips. If an orchid transforms from hard bulb by the grace of rain and light, let it find flowering in the moist ground of our silence. Let it bloom, not from photosynthesis, but desire. And let this body enter holding love under the tongue, its sublingual light, a faint disc against the shift to rose, dissolving and lighting this throat. Let the body be the beautiful dark butterfly coming expressly toward you from the dimly shining windows in a ballroom of guests. Let me slip between the cracks of your closed door to be touched the way the butterfly holds your finger, landing soft as sorrow, as rain. So here's an, another in the series. I have a couple more. And this one, um, Rilke was a deeply, uh, was a real sensualist, sensualist, which of course, anybody that reads his poem could tell. But uh, I came across this very <laughs> interesting quote in the Poetics of Space by Bachelard. And, uh, and well, the title of the poem is called The Fever. So she kind of rises from the fever. But the quote says, the poet Rilke enjoyed donning his maid suede gloves and dust, dusting furniture in the wee hours of the morning. 
like caressing the body of a lover. After this, he said, there's nothing that you do not know. There was a candle burning inside my brow. I could not pinch its spurred flame, so I crept out of the fevered bed to the forest of our floors and their cool tiles against my feet. Green and green again, like buttons sewn on our felt tree. It was just your hand at first, moving up the velvet drapes, independent as a whistle from nowhere. And then the thin figure of a man emerged slightly from the stage, the fingers and thumb gliding up the drape's edge. Something at the wrist, a thickness between the fingers like a new skin, with a slight webbing that layered the delicate hand. I saw my suede glove touching an edge, then moving slowly up the thick plated cord, then down. A finger drew the line of its own profile from forehead to neck, and I felt it as if it traced my own throat down to the clavicle, then up again to the edge of my left lobe. Shivering, the moon shook too, so sewn to the poet's mind as if the fabric of the scene tilted and buried itself in the night's scene. So um, I'm gonna hop to a last poem in this set. And part of it is so part of this book is the memoir poems. And some of it is also, there'll be a section of my experience of visiting there. And um, when I went in 2017 with my friend, we vowed that when we got to the land, uh, to where Museau was, we were gonna lay face down <laughs> so that we could just feel the earth and feel everything that was there. And we did it. And I got this little movie and this fantastic photo. So, so this is a, um, kind of a poem about that experience. And this is Museau de Ross with Switzerland, autumn 2017. And it has a quote from Rimbaud, arriving from always, you'll go away everywhere. Weren't our bodies drowsy with the ends of summer, our minds berry stained with the late Geneva evening, limbs still shaky from our long walk on cobbled streets before we took the train east to Sierra. We were two windows drawing in diamonds from the lake and the zoetrope of flickering villages. Weren't we tired when we finally arrived lost in the city until we found the last bus to the Alpine village. We slept in beds above the clouds, night carrying us in its milky cataract. And in the morning, didn't our innkeeper drive us in his dusty convertible to the winding road of the poet, leaving us with our silence to walk the sloping path past vineyards, butterscotch in the October slant what did we think it would be like when we finally fulfilled our promise to lay face down on this land? Think about how we opened into the earth, the ground remembering our hips, their sharp triggers pulling us back to where his body lay almost a century ago. Didn't his head rest on the same soft grass as the hours moved through him? Our own vanishing into earth's wild insomnia. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Beautiful. Thank you. Stunning poems, Lois. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. So really okay. nice, Lou. Such Elena, excuse me, Elena, could I just let some people know? Um, Ava, Jonas, um, and Susan, your mics are open while people are reading. So if you move anything, it goes off of the reader to your faces or the sounds you're making. So please make sure you're muted so we can listen. Also, Elena's not muted. <laughs> Our host. Well, she's the she's the host. She's the big deal. So nothing about that lady. I don't know about big deal, but yeah. No, you need to mute too. No, I, I don't move around. I don't. I, no. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Well, let's let's welcome William O'Daly. And. Okay, Bill. I'll un unmute you. Oops. Hey, great. So Bill is uh, featuring next month, by the way. Thank you, Elena. Thank you for being here. Great work, Lois, wonderful new work. Um, these two poems, um, I'll read them because they were uh, featured in uh, the artists and photographer Galen Garwood's um, website this month in his journal, Visions and uh, Voices. And um, they both connect with um, the work I've done with Pablo Neruda. Um, this first one, I, I had this dream when I was uh, preparing to translate my fourth Neruda book, The Sea and the Bells. It's one of the most vi vivid dreams I've ever had. And it confirmed a lot of what um, I was feeling about um, being so far into Neruda and continuing on that journey, something uh, Kenneth Rexroth at UCSB said would happen where at some point you have a hard time distinguishing between your own voice and uh, the poet you're translating. And uh, let's see, you know, he was a great collector of items, natural and human made. And um, you'll hear an allusion to uh, his wild haired love. That's uh, Matilde, his third wife. Uh, he called her La Chascona. Uh, the, the wild haired one is the best, is the uh, nicest translation. Unkempt what, is what it means literally, but at any rate. The dreamers. One night, a boy emerges from among the clothes hanging in the open closet and stands beside the bed. He is dressed in dark woolen trousers and white shirt buttoned at the neck and his shiny black hair is slicked back as they wore it in his day. He slowly reaches out to me, in his hand, a glass of water, iridescent. The colors are my voice, an offering drawn from the mineral spring of the first beginning. Now I stand at his grave where the world ends in the cormorants cry, and I can hear the horse's tail swishing among the trees. Like secret phosphorus, a gift of woolen socks binds the weaving hands to oceanic light. The plutonic rocks born of the far south rise from the shelves into our consciousness bearing the volcanic words he left to us. His wild hair love still sings as she dusts the weeping figurehead, the small black god, and the brass telescope, a gift from the French, and watches for his return from mountain or sea, where side by side they live on like water or inevitability. Yeah. 
And uh, the second poem um, Thank you. is in the uh, manner of uh, Neruda's Book of Questions, in which all the poems are questions, uh, made of questions, usually couplets. Uh, it's called In Franconia Gorge. Franconia Gorge uh, is in the Liberty Mountains of New Hampshire. It's a, flu a natural flume with an incredibly powerful um, stream of water that goes cascading 800 feet. Is this ever descending water, human tears? Do they mean nothing? Will the stone heads that weep in the late afternoon fade away? Without you, how will we weep when we need to? How will the earth smell after the last drops of rain? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Quite welcome. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, I see Dan Navarro is putting his headphones on, so maybe we'll move on to some music. Well, please welcome. Good, good. They are permanent fixtures, to be honest. I think I wear them <laughs> all the time. This has been a beautiful evening, and I thank you so much for having me. Everybody has just been so wonderful. It's also particularly nice to see so many old friends, and I understand it's your anniversary. Thank you, um, yes. It was this of, week. I'm one of the few people who knew you before. I met Elena yeah. in London in 1980 when I had just moved there. And I guess you were getting just pretty much getting ready to move here. Wow. And we restock up our friendship after I moved back to the United States at the end of 1980. And I guess about 10 years ago discovered that we had mutual friends in this community. It's a tiny, tiny world. It is. Um, I'm not going to say anything about the songs. I'm going to let you figure them out as they come out. A dream I flew like a bird to the top of the mountain and there you were bathed in the shadows alone in the dark with a lock and chain around your bulletproof heart minute by minute Time after time Body to body Crossing over the line Wrapped in each other A shower of sparks Began to melt the ice away From your bulletproof heart Somebody tell me please Are we really here? Disappear. And all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put the genie back in the bottle again. Now I try to remember to try to forget the way you felt that night, but it ain't happened yet. One perfect kiss. Blew the shackles apart They keep you locked inside Your bulletproof heart Somebody please tell me please what's happening here The image is hazy But the memory is so clear And all the king's horses And all the king's men Can't put the genie back in the bottle again So where are 
are the fault lines? How deep are the ties? And can I ever touch the fire I see in your eyes? We could come together, or we'll come apart. But I cannot come away from your bulletproof heart. said and did won't happen again so how do we finish where do we start to break down the walls around your bulletproof heart Thank you, Dad. God, that was perfection. Thank you. You're very Thank kind. You. Thank you well, so much. Well, in this crowd, you have to bring your A game because I've heard some amazing, amazing <laughs> stuff this evening. Oh, my God. It's kind of You'll Dan, come back, I, I come back again, right? Say that again, sorry? Yeah. Come back. Oh, anytime. Anytime. Yeah, no, I mean, we would do oh, like great. Rounds. I'm not going anyplace. <laughs> I, live, I live here. <laughs> All right, so um, let's have Margot all the way from Paris. Let's see. Yes, I unmute. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Lois, for such beautiful, beautiful work. It's an honor to read next to you. This is a poem that just appeared in the Persimmon Tree Journal, and it was written immediately after January the 6th. I'd say it's my epitaph for America in these last and yes, lost days. It's called Postlude. Leaf fall, dirt caked as love half buried, its skeletal hands that waved come home. Infants in someone's embrace, aged next to shout how the personal was political political to personal before their winning hands were maimed. Land after land, note makeshift memorials strewn with children's pens, stems of what were flowers, burned coals. It was journalists who were massacred that year, that winter riot prelude to fascist boots on lost ground. In the beginning was a word, fine-toothed as a soul, handheld, personal, political, gunned in its birth, in its birth zone. Kalayuga, they'll call it now, on one side of the mount, on this slope of dirt, in the beginning was the word we wanted more, and the word was human. No, prelude, leaf fall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margo. <sighs> yes, Ashton. Ashton? Ashton Cynthia Clark. Yes, my dear, I'm here. Thank you for including me. Um, as Elena knows, and some of you may know, I'm not a poet, I'm a storyteller, but I've been attending Elena's rap salon for a while. And 
uh, since my mother passed away in 95, I hadn't written any poetry, but I've been inspired to try again. So these are just a couple of haiku that I did recently, both a tribute to the first time I went camping and it was such an unexpected pleasure. <clears throat> these woods, your refuge, thick, brambled, provide shelter, I offer my lips. And the second one, wet moss underfoot, our limbs slapping on hot rock, only the deer saw. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashton. Those were so, great. Yes. Alice. Alice Pero. Hi. Welcome. Wonderful reading. Really, really good. Wow. Totally impressed. Things we can do or not. Here in this world of leaves and leavings, dappled and dimpled, speckled and wrinkled, we can breathe in and out with birds, scamper with rabbits, race with hysterical squirrels. Our plate can be loaded with pickles and squash, lox and melted cheese, rainbow carrots, and the strangest lopsided quesadilla, none of it sticking to our tongues. We can scatter dust from our keyboards, dance in confetti coming from high windows, march in protest parades and long gowns. We can duck Bullets sprayed out from guns fired by angry mobs who throw molotovs. We can carry signs splashed with blood. We can reserve cocktails online, get drunk alone in our rooms, pretend happiness despite world gloom. We can be skewered or screwed, read our books backward, to show our contempt, never answer the door when the doorbell rings. We can write poems that sing and songs that thud, always another one coming and another as though that would save the world. We can take baths in mud, in a stream in the desert, a stream that flows on and on because we are there willing it, willing the water and the beautiful rushing sounds so it all comes round again. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you. Thank Great you. audience. Um, Elena Karina Byrne. Elena? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. I was trying to respond. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read one poem in response to this beautiful variety of works. Um, it's from my forthcoming book, If This Makes You Nervous, with Omnidon. And the poem is called Poetry Substance Abuse is a Darwin Finch Drawing. In motion or air of abandon, when you least expect it, much like when they say your next love will come to you when you least expect it. Your face stopping there at the equatorial bulge because its pull at either seam is one continuous seam mount ring, a fire already put out on your head, leaving you somewhere vocabulary continuum caught on pause. The pause button, the same as the mute button, same as all faith in God is no God, same as you are let your last thought swallowed silver before it said out loud to a tiny hand mirror sleeping in the involuntary dark inside your purse big enough for the birdcage thrown out in that alley trash heap 
its past songs now more a consequence of gravity than feathers defiance. Perfect is your animal shapes imperfection in the making. Every dark matters silent distribution shape and origin tangle. Sweet physical chaos make whatever creates unequal harm. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, um, Karen, are you ready for a song? Yes, I am. Okay, Karen Spritzler, everybody. I do hear someone breathing. <laughs> <laughs> Stop breathing? breathing. No breathing. No <laughs> breathing, please. Stop breathing. Okay, here we go. So, um, Dan Navarro, <clears throat> I have paid money to see you at McCabe's many, many times. <laughs> so, I'm kind of intimidated. Um, Um, this is a song called um, When the Weather Changes. <clears throat> and it's about when our feelings can change like that. Cold is the day when the heart can't be touched And cold is the night When the mind sees too much And hot is the wind that comes rushing in when the weather changes like that. Cool is the air when the storm past and cool is the way for the heart to rest and warm is the wind that comes rushing
Even the moons could glow Can calm the stone Sweet is the breeze That happiness is And so is the air when the sky is clear and gentle is the wind that comes rushing in when the weather changes like that Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, Linda, are you, will you be reading later? Will you stay to read? We're going to have uh, you, you, Sharma next, and then maybe Linda, if she wants to read. Okay. So please welcome Yuyu Sharma, all the way from Nepal. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Uh, so wonderful. Uh, I am sorry, due to some trouble, I am not having my uh, video goes off and on. So you won't be able to see me. Because there's some trouble uh, with the thing. It is a wonderful evening, and I'm, I'm a greeting to everybody from Kathmandu. Uh, it's the morning time here. As you know, I'm stuck here for more than a year uh, due to pandemic and uh, we had earthquakes before that. So the poem that I want to read today is uh, uh, about earthquakes that uh, occurred uh, a few years ago. And they say uh, that uh, probably there's going to be a bigger earthquake, uh, which may have just wipe everything off. So we live in this kind of, I wonder why I'm here, you know, all the time. So the poem say, uh, the title is, where would my story end? You know, in, in the time of Vedas, the ancient scripts when written, uh, Himal didn't exist. So India was an island, and Nepal uh, was an, I mean, the whole thing, region was an island, and he has came out of this very climactic uh, thing. So this poem called, Where Would My Story End? Where would my story end? In the crack paradise, jolting from an elastic energy, trapped in earth's sanguine womb, a heaven tilted sideways, the paralytic face of the hillside grandma left out in the cold by my demons of a flailing polity. They predict a disaster here, a fracture, a future fracture from the accumulation of an ocean of molten mass. A divine zeal, a reversed vision of the earth own making, re retracting herself into an island again, a Jambu deep, an island of Vedic eternal hymns. Someday they say, Earth shall change her side in sleep, exasperated from a turbulence of the reservoirs of kinetic energy, sunken from the vision of an impending doom. A goddess Ajima or Harati, our primordial mother goddesses of numerous offsprings, bearing their own squealing newborn beneath the weight of her hefty torso in the whirling black tunnels of postnatal sleep. Geophysicists, panelists, 
prophets of whimsical west, pundits of the twisted east. I see them squinting into the fogged holes, imagining a cosmic crash in the valley of the Lord himself. But where is there a way for me to desert it and my grand story, my Himalayas, my Nepal, like my own destiny, a life suspended in mid-sentence, a journey in smug lanes of centuries crooked sleep, the broad-chested canyons, glaciers melting like tantric trophies from master of time, Padam Sambhava's snow sanctuaries, full of thwarted bodies, of bleary-eyed wondrous re reeking of hallucinating yantras, hubris of consuming fresher fragments of newer galaxies. And tomorrow, what if this very moment, Kailash opens up, tearing up the carpets of white rabbits, racing along the green pastures of turquoise lakes? What if large zone pinnacles of patience crumbles and newly born republic turns into a tiny morsel in the jaws of a mighty dragon of an apocalypse? Where, I wonder, would my story end? Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Yuyu. Thank you. In the leave. Okay, moving on. Thank you. Let's hear. Um, um, okay, okay, okay. Who do we have here? Sorry. Robbie. What if people disappear? Okay, I'm here. Okay, here. Okay. Okay. Um, Nesta. Yes, I have oh, some yeah. eight poems just appeared in this beautiful uh, anthology that you probably can't see uh, from Aeolian Harp. And Alexis is in there with me too. Um, so I'm going to read one of those poems from that folio uh, called Second Daughter. And it's after an episode of the Netflix series, The Chef's Table. My mother cried. I was her second daughter, little better than a death. In India, no parties or celebrations welcome a girl child, only slammed doors, impatient voices. But I come from a warrior clan. Our family compound looks down on broken shanties. Father said, I must be mindful of this accident of birth, must make a mark. I shout my name from every open window, demanding to be heard. To make my mother proud, I earned a law degree at Oxford, married well, but still felt empty, alone in a far off country, until by chance, Paratha cooking in a stranger's kitchen summoned me to India to learn to cook. My mother was angry. She said, a lawyer belongs in court. In her kitchen, I watched and listened and she could not deny me taught me to feed the spirit with a handful of flour and oil, to find the rhythm of a meal fashioned out of onion and potatoes, garlic and cardamom, ingredients that with patience and a practiced hand release their flavors, become a symphony. I hear the murmur of the sauce as it thickens the rattle of the stock pot, savor the scent of spices roasting in the skillet with a bit of oil. It taught me faith, sealing the pot of rice with a braid of dough, trusting each grain would soften and swell like a pearl, yielding to the steam. At home in England, I spoke with everyone who looked familiar taught them my mother's recipes. Soon enough, I welcomed guests as though they were God himself. 
everyone knows my name. I owe this to my mother, to the women at the front, of, um, standing silent at the stove while I work the front of the house, sharing the story of this food, this accident of birth. The guests begin as strangers, leave as friends. Back in the village, I unseal the locked gates, embracing every second daughter, drying her mother's tears, every birth worthy of a festival, a feast, fireworks lighting up the sky. Mm. Thank you, Robbie. Robbie, that's beautiful. I, I, it's amazing what you did with that. I watched that, that uh, series. It was incredible to see her evolution. It was. And how she came from, you know, that from the law all the way to food and then the, the celebration of the second daughters. And, and I, I love what you did with that. It's just um, beautifully lyric. Thank you. I have a whole chapbook of them, of those episodes also oh. a few from street food but i'm having trouble finding a home for it still looking all right you'll find it <laughs> thank you so much thank you. i think i'm going to conk out i'm so tired i'm sorry Beautiful. but thank you so thank much you. for hosting me well, thank and you. come again thank you for a wonderful evening thank you thank you so much okay let's get on Please welcome from the East Coast, Paul Thiel. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Good. I'll try to put a picture in, let's see. Doesn't work. Okay. I've I've got a little poem I wrote a few years ago in New Orleans. Uh, the title is By a Fountain, New Orleans Botanical Garden. Lying flat on a bench, my back embracing the stone, that's all there is. The water's music dancing in my head. Where is the bug, the annoyance? Black lines crisscross silently above, branches of live oak piercing the clouds, moving slowly to the rendezvous with weather. Sun peeks through. That's it, baby. Give me some of that warmth. The heavy branches bend down to listen. Do they hear the song of the flute? The bronze players standing in the fountain in memory of Eugenia and Joseph. Third degree lady, impressively tall. My God, what feet she possesses. Her mouth, not to the pipe at all. An illusion, her eyes shut, impervious to familiar. I think she listens to the water, though. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Moving on. Jim. Jim Bald. I'm unmuting. Am I audible? Yes. Indeed. OK, yes. here we go. <laughs> There's been so much beautiful work. I'm, I'm a little shook up. Okay. <clears throat> now, can you still see me? No, only a picture. Only a picture? Well, yeah. I, I've got to read off of a different app. So here we go. I got to do it this way. Let me try one more thing. How about now? Can you see me now? Yeah. Yes. All right, let me try it this way then. Okay. Um, here we go. I would line up outside the classroom five or 10 minutes before the end of lunch. 
had to get my favorite seat. I was a one man line, first in line, finishing my lunch outside the door, not wanting to miss a minute of this inspired, feverish, nearly out of control outlier among all my teachers and possibly among all other geometry teachers anywhere. Eventually, other students caught on and started lining up behind me. Once we settled, he would start each class silently by drawing a large circle, the full radius of his arm's length with his human Nautilus curvature limb mechanics on a flat blackboard. For the first couple of weeks, we would simply wonder why he drew the circle as he initially said nothing about it. Then, collectively, we realized each day he was attempting to draw a perfect circle and how incredibly unlikely it is to ever achieve this feat. This was not a diagram. This was performance. Week after week, as he veered closer or further to or from perfection, with all of us watching the path of his chalk, it became more of a high wire act. We started to follow his deliberate circular stroke, traveling from his shoulder out through his arm to his hand through the chalk with more anticipation, more appreciation of what a perfect circle would be, how achingly close he would get each time on some days we would break out in applause, surprised by our own vocal reaction, our eyes retracing the path of the newly drawn circle, gauging the accuracy of its curvature with the compasses and micrometers in our minds. Mr. Shore always offered up the chalk to anyone who wanted to give it a try and the occasional intrepid student would step up, gaining our immediate respect, still her or himself like a martial artist, deeply focusing before breaking bricks. Sometimes their chalk line would veer off, but often they would trace the approximation of a perfect circle impressively well but never quite perfect. Ultimately, Mr. Shore recounted the story of Michelangelo winning an art competition by stepping up to his canvas and simply brilliantly drawing a pitch perfect circle. There is a mystery to Plato's ideal forms an infinite resolution to their curves or lines. They exist in our world and simultaneously in a higher dimension. Mr. Shore provided an impossibly impassioned, profusely creative introduction to each major geometric form, points and lines, the premises of geometry cannot be proved and must simply be accepted for the discussion to progress. Zeno's paradox, triangles, the most powerful of all shapes, pyramids, geodesic domes, and ultimately the most beautiful and alluring of all forms, spheres seemingly designed to capture our attention and never let go. And then the golden mean, philosophy, philosophy in a high school math class, the youthful genius of Euclid, ancient Greek architects who built entire structures with only lines and curves, strings and compasses, bisecting circles, crisscrossing rectangles, the so-called 
basic geometry with almost no numbers. And I had a natural talent for this. I found myself in an unintended rivalry with the other geometrically talented student in class. He was affronted by my neck and neck competition with him, but I was fascinated by how he got to the completed proof through a completely different sequence of theorems. Now, if this class had occurred 30 years later, everything would have gone viral. In the future world of social media, Mr. Shore would have been a superstar. His perfect circles would have been a TikTok sensation with everyone from elementary school kids to Kip Thorne to Justin Timberlake to Simone Biles posting their attempts. He would have had geometry fans of every age. He would have had millions of YouTube subscribers. There would have been a Mr. Shore geometry app. He might have been seen as much as a philosopher, as a geometry teacher. Unfortunately for me, every math or physics class that followed <laughs> with run-of-the-mill teachers dryly assigning so many units of each chapter, drawing uh, <laughs> boring <laughs> diagrams on the blackboard, offering absolutely no deep or mind-expanding reflections, Mr. Shore may have done just as much harm as good in my progress by being so brilliant. His ultimate proof was to demonstrate that math and physics, art and imagination are all different surfaces of the same ideal form. And that perfect circle he attempted to draw at the start of every class hovers right before me in my mind. Oh, I love that so much. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> oh, my God. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, Good. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I love that so much. Oh, that's good. <laughs> this was the premiere. Oh, that was so good. I mean, <clears throat> I, I had a geometry teacher that I loved also, and I'm, I'm not a math person, but I... she, she made it that like Mr. Shore did. Yeah. Yeah. It he was a rock star. It was yeah. something beautiful. Oh my Thank god. You. I just love that poem so much. You Thank should you, you should you, so you should start the videos, Jim. You should do it. Make the make the circle. You can make it you can bring it to life. Alice, how wonderful <laughs> just to see Face. Sensation. Start drawing the circles and get your. Oh, yes, if when I do it live, I'll, I'll just keep drawing that circle. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll tell you a little when... trick to drawing the circle. If you if you think about drawing the circle, it it looks terrible. Like if you right. think oh, I'm gonna, you have to just like be be zen with it and just like right. think. Okay, circle, boom, Thank and you. then it's perfect when you do Thank it that you. way. Thank you so much. That's perfect. Uh, That's beautiful. Okay, we could go on and on. Moving on, it's moving zen. on, moving on. Thank you so much, Jim. Melissa, I, I've been asked if you can still read, or you'd just so much love to hear you or say something. Melissa? Oh, maybe she's having a cup of tea. Okay, um, Thea. Thea Mirkofer. Thank you, Elena. Hi, everyone. Thank you for a very soothing, beautiful evening um, at the end of a difficult week. The speck. I'm afloat and adrift, alert but asleep the unknown sum of noble parts, unmoored and unstoppable, illuminating blindly in absolutely all directions. A purpose-seeking morsel of universal grub, I scour for truth in barrels of mud. I yell out platitudes about beauty and self-love, though to myself the self is above. 
I'm lost in the labyrinth of certitudes, a particle in a world of magnitudes. I bang and I yop in the land of Whoville, but no elephant stopped to show me goodwill. I'm alone in the world and I'm small and I'm meek. And the purpose I seek is engraved on my forehead, out of sight. It reads backwards in mirrors and it sears to the touch. Who am I and why? I'm alone in the world and I'm small and I'm meek. And the purpose I seek is engraved on my forehead. Can you read it to me? Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. Stephen Heather, how, how is Donovan? Can you stick around some more? We, we, can do a, we can do one song before we have to go back in and check on him. Okay. All right. Um, let's have. Can you can you hang around for for a while though, right? Okay. Okay. Well, let's have uh, Pamela Pamela Clay now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena. Um, I'm going to sing for you uh, the song that Jacques Brel wrote begging his wife to a pregnant wife to please not leave him he was uh, not um, not a not a husband that she could trust and she was just done with him and this is what he wrote to beg her to stay Ne me quitte pas, il faut tout oublier, tout peut s'oublier, qui s'enfuit déjà, oublier le temps, les malentendus et le temps perdu, à savoir comment oublier ces heures qui tuaient parfois à coup de pourquoi. Le cœur de bonheur ne me quitte pas, ne me quitte pas, ne me quitte pas, ne me quitte pas. Moi, je t'offrirai des perles de pluie venues de pays où il ne pleut pas. Je creuserai la terre jusqu'après ma mort. Pour couvrir ton corps doré de lumière, je ferai un domaine où l'amour sera roi, où l'amour sera roi, où tu seras reine. Ne me quitte pas, ne me quitte pas, ne me quitte pas, ne me quitte pas. Ne me quitte pas, je t'inventerai des mots insensés que tu comprendras. Je te parlerai de ces amants-là qui ont vu de fois leur cœur s'embrasser. Je te raconterai l'histoire de ce roi qui est mort de n'avoir pas pu te rencontrer. Ne me quitte pas. Ne me quitte pas. Ne me quitte pas. Ne me quitte pas. On a vu souvent rejaillir le feu de l'ancien volcan qu'on croyait trop vieux. Il est, paraît-il, des terres brûlées d'un an plus de blé qu'un mer avril et qu'on vient le soir pour que le ciel flamboie le rouge et le noir ne s'épousent pas <rire> ne me quitte pas ne me quitte pas ne me quitte pas ne me quitte pas Ne 
Ne me quitte pas. Je ne vais plus parler. Je ne vais plus pleurer. Je me cacherai là à te regarder. Cause et sourire. Et te goûter. Chanter et puis rire. Laisse-moi devenir l'ombre de ton ombre. L'ombre de ta main. L'ombre de ton chien ne me quitte pas, ne me quitte pas, ne me quitte pas, ne me quitte pas. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you. Thank you, my darling. I love you, Elena. Oh. Gorgeous, Pamela. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dana. I love you. I love you all. Uh, Lois, would you continue? I am coming back to everybody. Don't don't worry. But uh, yeah. It's a long night, so so I will. Um, I'll just read like maybe one poem. How's that? <laughs> maybe one or two, but one. Okay. okay. Let's see. All right. So this is from Night Ladder, and um, and it's called Apple. I'm an apple in the pocket of this old coat of yours, honest and round. You feel me blindly with rough hands. You dare take me out to examine me. The deep wine bruises, the garnet wounds. What green is left reddens quickly in your palm. Twist my stem between your fingers until it snaps, then lay me down on the pine table. Split me open with your sharpest knife. Your tongue draws out each seed, dark eyes that want to grow in you. Place this slice between your lips. One bite to remember an orchard. Mm. <laughs> wow. That's it. Beautiful. Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> but you'll come back. You'll come back. Stephen Heather. How we how is how are we doing? How is Donovan doing? Still asleep. Okay. Can you hear us? Yes. All right. tired out like you don't want no more I can see your love is homeless tonight and the hunger brings you to my door hello Hello, come in, come in, get 
But your death will call my love If you keep wandering Hello, 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 hello Make yourself at home Come into my life, my love Don't you be alone Thank you. Thank you, Steve and Heather. And now let's hear Dana Leslie Hodges. Thank you. Hey, Dana. Hey. Have a beautiful night. <clears throat> My poem is called Riptide. Alone in riptide crowd, I feel insignificant as I tread tides of conversations amongst others. I am invisible in fog of unknown. Shy voice holds me back. Words retreat as lips begin to form. I cling to a buoy as my thoughts sway and ebb and flow in midst of crowd, I am visible yet unseen, quiet with much to say. Awkward cadence of silence swells within. Roar of waves crest in cacophony, an echo of discussion hangs in humid air. Thick water creates a moat around me. Words crash into mouth. Listeners ebb with momentum and I swallow my vocabulary. Retreat into riptide familiarity. Safe, lonely, exhaustive emptiness. With so much to say and no one to listen. I give up the struggle, let salt water hold my body. My own tears remember the contours of melancholy. I watch shore fade as I drift from land, where crescendo collapses into distant hush and alone feels less alone than single in a crowded room where I breathed invisible and 
my voice went unspoken. That's all. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. You're so not invisible. <laughs> so Thank not. You. It's all very visible. From Paris to Kathmandu to, I think Ireland has gone to sleep, but anyway, we're here. And um, let's welcome Armand Kennard, my very, very old friend. He was there at the very first Rap Saloon, guys. So if you don't know his work, I mean, he's pretty awesome. Welcome, thank Armand. You. Thank you, Elena. And thank you to all of you. It's been a great night thus far. And I got this piece right here, nice little snack for you. Let's see how it goes. Love on her body, love on her body, mm -hmm. love on her body, love on her body. Mm -hmm. Tonight her elbows will fill me up, followed by phalanges. Then I will read her skin. It is all written there. Love on her body, love on her body. Mm -hmm. A pleasant scent from long ago, corset and cobblestone memory glow. Now brought here, flickering candles. Her voice under the moon, together we will bloom as the children of night. The story of our passion is to be heard. Love on her body, love on her body. Mm -hmm. Love on her body. Mm -hmm. Here there is no fear, no shame. She presses her torso to my face and allows me to swallow. Thank you. Thank ouch, you. ouch, ouch, <laughs> <laughs> Ow. ouch. Ouch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I see Susan Rogers is in, is in the house. Susan. Thank you, Armand. Susan. Oh yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, just having, I'm having some difficulty with my phone, Elena, so maybe that's why I was kind of going off and mute and it's having some trouble. So maybe go to the next person first because it's- Okay, all right, hard. here we go. Let me see, is there another page or are we all on one page now? I think we're on, on one page. So um, Eva, are you reading something? Am I unmuted? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to read a poem by that my husband, Evan Mike West wrote, and it is in his newest uh, poetry book, Cold Blue Roses. And it's based on a painting that belonged to my parents and I inherited it. And uh, I thought I'd show everybody a picture of it so they can kind of imagine what the poem is about. It's called The Inherited Painting. High up on the high wall of our bedroom, there is a painting of a pastoral grove in sunshine. It is a nice expressionist piece that we love very much. I remember it from first seeing it at my late in-law's house in its prominent living room place. It seemed more at home in their house, but they are gone and the house belongs to other people now. 
decades later. And the painting, well, we have given it a good home, even though we did not buy it, did not decide to sacrifice other niceties to own it did not agree that it was too amazing not to own it, did not congratulate each other on acquiring it. Hanging it so prominently, it is more a piece of the past than an artwork we had to have above all. And yet there is a chain of ownership we are proud to acknowledge. And we're proud to love it for the extra reasons that go with missing loved ones. But today, after 30 years, we talk about it as a fantastic piece of art, like we were the lucky original acquirers, like it chose our wall after decades of other appreciators. We talk about it like we had seen it first, brought it home first, hung it first, and studied it first, inch by inch, then loved it inch by inch first. Thank you. And I just wanted to congratulate Lois for her gorgeous read of poems. I'm just stunned. Thank you, Lois, for reading those. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, that means so much because, you know, we've worked on this together and you really haven't heard any of these poems, maybe only one or so. So That's it's, true. it's exciting yes. to share them with you this week. Yes. Morning. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. You're Eva. welcome. Eva. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, Odilia, are you reading something? Sure, I have, I have a poem I could read. Okay. And thank you for inviting me up. Um, this is gonna be, this is called On Magnolias and it's for Frida Kahlo after her painting Magnolias. And it's from my upcoming book um, called Somersault Love from Flower Song uh, Press. You painted magnolias, pure smelling and white, the color of soft linen, a canvas you entered, then slashed open wounds and bled upon shadows, loss of life and love splayed in living color, splattered onto ek root in shades of flowers you braided into your hair. Back to get to the future, you time walked into your paintings, attached to your other you, reconnected to mother roots that reach the ancestors. You bled everywhere in beauty as bold as you, a constant image emblazoned across our retinas, burning and wet with tears we've shed along with you, fragile and wild and in love with the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aurelia. Thank you. Gracias. Okay, um, Jeff, uh, Jeffries, RJ, RJ Jeffries. Are you there? All the way in Boston? Might, might have to unmute myself. That would be a good start. Uh, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm still semi-conscious. Okay. Well, this might be a little bit long, but the hell with it. It's called When On My Horse As One. A meridian sun spots our direction as an azure sky spans boundless before us. We ride to discover the horizon secrets in rolling hills and a virgin trail in the distance of an open range as one. Along an enchanted mesa we gallop, heart and hoof beating in synchronicity. The rhythm of the ride in every stride. She my saddle wind and I her airy mount as one. Agent verdant pastures draw us near. Whispers in the wind beckoning, come brush my tall wild grass, roll across my gentle meadows, resplendent with wildflowers in bloom. Their glory is a gift I lay before you, only this I ask in return. Leave my beauty as you found it and come back soon to me as one. That's it. Mm -hmm. 
Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, RJ. You're welcome, Elena. Thank you. Uh, Susan, did you sort it out? Yeah. Okay. Susan, how is everybody? <laughs> Sorry. Do, do we get to see you? Okay, there we go. Can, can I, I, I'm back on video. Can you see me? No. I'm having, I mean, now, maybe? No. Is it go? Is it okay? There you go. Yeah. Well, you know, it doesn't matter if you see me or not. It's okay. <clears throat> so I'll just I'll read it without. So um, it's Valent. It was Valentine's Day this month. So I was thinking maybe I would read a poem um, about passion. So this poem actually it's a it's a shape poem. It's written around uh, a circle. So I don't know if you can kind of see. Let's see if you can see that. Can you see that? You may not be able to see it. It's kind of like a cloud written around a circle and it's in honor of Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, if you've ever seen her paintings of bones looking up at the blue sky, um, that you can kind of look through like a window. So it's called Georgia. In Abiquiu, you coaxed your colors from the rock, the sky. Your shapes bloomed whole from desert earth, sensual as lips. They kissed and curved into your hands, gorgeous as your name, Georgia. The sound blooms just so on the tongue. Through the O, I see blue open spaces, hollow bones embraced by clouds, sky, swerving burning liquid windows filled with fire, flowers, femurs, all life framed into the hot pink center. Thank you. You're welcome. Dan Navarro, did you leave us? No, not at all. I was doing some stuff and I don't want to distract from the from the people's oh, performances. Oh, how lovely. So I just Thank want to... You. No, pleasure. Okay. I'm misunderstanding. Are you calling on me? I'll do it. Yeah, now. yeah yes. I'm yes, sorry. Yes, I thought yes. you were just asking why I'd no, left, no, no, but no. I hadn't left. Are you, are you are you ready? I am. I'm just okay. I'm trying to decide between a song I wrote for a friend of mine's unmade film about um, someone from the barrio or another heartbreak song. <laughs> When in doubt, there's always heartbreak. There you go. I found an angel part under Oklahoma sky. In a melody Gentle as the night It was the purest sound That I had ever known Then it was gone Into a song I'll never Sweetest words a heart could ever hear reach deep inside of me before they disappeared. And as I held them close, I had to lay. Into a place I'll never know Now I'll try to understand 
Understanding comes so slow I am a simple man Holding steady as she goes Oh, thank you so beautiful. much. Thank you, everybody. So pretty. So pretty, Dan. Thank wow. you. Is that a Dan doll on top of the piano? There is There is a Dan and Eric, a Lowen and Navarro bobblehead over there. Yes. And there's yet another one over here. It's um, it's uh, vanity and megalomania makes me do this. But uh, yeah, but people gifted me those and it's it's a little on the bizarre side. But I put all the weird stuff up on the piano. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I'm, stick I'm sticking around. I ain't going. Oh, anywhere. yes. I mean, we're, we're not going anywhere. Oh, exactly. We're going to have to. Um, Thank you. Uh, hear Margo again. Because I think she's had some, Par some uh, Parisian coffee now. So she's awake. You're, you're muted still. Yes, I've had my morning coffee now. It's eight o'clock in the morning in Paris and I am awake. And this began as a haiku and it wouldn't stop. And so it's called no longer a haiku. Her children used to call me the lipstick bird. Now a man asks, are you still living as though the real living might begin at some other date? Would the real living be wiped away if you knew the day you die? I say no, planting an infant vine in its bed. I like the old man of the cliff who taught every day is a good day to die, but I'd rather not suffer the good Buddha notwithstanding. But back to lipstick, this is certainly no longer a haiku. She says the child of her child, she who has many children, I who am an old woman and child of skies. She says the child of her child says, look, lipstick apocalypse as the sun rises 
and stains the sky. And I have a sudden nosebleed staining all over my pale lace nightgown. Ask the next question, I know nothing more than last night's dark garden and tomorrow's breeze. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Margot. Alice, do you have something else? Unmute, unmute yourself. No, you're still muted. Unmute, unmute. I'm, I'm using my finger as though it's a phone. There you go. I, I know. Can make it go off like that. Silly. Over the landscape. Truly, I have no sense at all anymore. Spreading myself out like jelly all over the landscape. Feeling not so much the colors, but the smoosh of it. A laying on of green, me green all over, and the bird's twitter adds a tickle of my spineless spine. I'm supine in the air, a floating that neither begins nor ends anywhere. Are you there, or she, or it? Go, don't figure, but figure yourself as part and parcel of this escape, a smooth communion, an eclipse of body-made, ready-made, pre-packaged senses, something just made, made to will, invisible, acting for myself, for the birds, the bats, the woodpecker knocking for another woodworm, or even for that tiny water bug on the water, the infinitesimal ripple before the beginning of strutting sun's day. So good to see and hear you again, Alice. Thank you, Jim Bald. Good to see and hear you, old time's sake. Yup. <laughs> that was a sweetheart of a poem there. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think we, we, we have Alexis anymore, right? Alexis? I'd never give up, you know, so. Okay, moving on, moving on. Um, Armand, do you have another one? Sure. He says, sure. <laughs> Thank you for having me again. Thank you. She saw my eyes turn black as legs opened wider, receiving more than the average bone, a vortex created by will. Black beyond the black, night acts that erase and replace, chanting the language of the ancients, vaginal chambers, echoes of bass, my eyes black, moving inside an unfamiliar face. In comes the canines. She could no longer look. Am I for blood? Am I for death? She saw my eyes turn black, peering down into her lust. It is of girth and robust. A sudden chill swells. Her mind wanders underneath me, seeing the galaxy through my eyes. Hmm. Okay, I'm, I need a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Or something. I need something. I need, I need, I need to put something in. in, in that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, Susan, Susan Rogers. <clears throat> yeah. Let's yeah. See. Um, 
Okay, actually, I was going to read another one. Let me see. Okay, I can. Have I read Sunflowers in Your Hand recently? That was one from my mom. I was mom. thinking about just i mean we have a different audience so it doesn't matter if you repeat things oh okay all right okay so i think i read this before but it recently um i recently gave the got the book yeah it's from the altadena literary review i recently just got it in hand and um i was reminded of it so let me read it again it's um it's acrostic it's from um from a, a image of someone holding a girl holding it from quill and parchment holding a sunflower in her hand Okay, let me, let me get it here. Okay. It's called Sunflowers in Your Hand. Let me see if I can actually, am I on, I think I, can you see me? No. Okay, let me see if I can change that. Okay, there you go. Okay. Now you can, right? Okay, so this is called Sunflowers in Your Hand for Jane. Excuse me, let me put the light on here. I don't know if you can see, okay. I wonder if I will recognize you when you return in a different form. I like to think your breath so intimately part of mine that when you are reborn, even if you wear white organza as a bride or the black habit of a nun, if you appear much younger than you were in a sweater striped in cyan blue with wild sunflowers in your hand, I will remember you. Just as I remember the shine of a sun-dazzled stream after it's gone dry, the rhythm of staccato rain when I swing my hammock under cloudless skies, or the sound of laughter in a dream of exquisite joy, even if you choose to be my cat, a hummingbird, a bright skilled koi. And if you are born in another country, don't speak words I understand. If you're not female this time, but instead a boy, I hope there will be some note of you that sings. Your music indisputably through the differences of then and now. So I will know you are the one that it's you come back in whatever form you come. It's wonderful, Susan. Good night, Elena. Good night. Not everybody take care and stay safe. It was magical. Thank you for allowing me to be among, among such wonderful, talented people. You're all divine. Good night, RJ. Thank you. Good night, Jeff. Night, Nightingale. Good night. Okay. Elena Costa, do you have something? Oh, did I miss her? This is my Romanian friend, Elena Costa. Well, I can say something. I can say that it was a beautiful evening that I was very, very impressed by and touched, not impressed, touched, really touched by some of the poems and the songs. So I enjoy, you know, I, I'm by training, I'm an engineer, by passion, I am um, an architect and an artist, but uh, I, I, I love poetry and I think that it was marvelous. So thank you, Elena. And thank all, thanks all of you. Each one was different and each one made me feel, which is extremely pleasant. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Okay, so how are we doing? Is, did I miss somebody? Does, would there anybody else like to do something? I'll sing a song. Okay. Yes, okay. Can you sing our song, our favorite song? No, not that one, not that one. Um, <laughs> let's see here. <clears throat> well, we'll see if I can do this 
Yes. Um, it's, uh, it's a song by Susie Williams. Do you know Susie Williams? Yeah. yeah. And she's an amazing person. And, <clears throat> and, and Brad Kay uh, did the music for it. I'm going to try to sing it. Uh, I hope I can do it. It's called Beat My Wings. I am an angel My mother told me so And if my mother said so Then it's true And I have tried to live my life in spite of all the strife. Try to live the way she taught me to. She said. Karen. Thank you, Susan. Oh, Karen. Beautiful. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Susie Williams. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dear ones, all, Elena and all, I need more coffee, and that means I have to make it. So I'm going to say good morning and good night to all of you, and thank you again for inviting me, Elena. Thank you. Thank you. Come anytime. Come next month. Elena, I'm going to say something else. Sure. Yeah, well, I attended Elena's um, uh, poetry club in Santa Monica, and I loved it. But I must say that I was kind of afraid of how will it be on Zoom. And I must say it was beautiful. In many ways, it was even nicer because I could see everybody so from much so much closer, and because we had you had guests from all over the world. So uh, I just wanted to comment the fact that 
Zoom does some very good things for this poetry club. And also, you are all poets, I am not. Uh, you are all uh, singers and artists and I'm not. And I must say that I don't know if you feel so great because I think you should. There is so much sensitivity. There is so much human feelings in everything that you do that you should very be very proud of yourself. Thank you, Elena. Thank you so much. Okay. Well said. I have another poem I could read if there's time. Okay, sure. Go ahead, Dana. Thanks. Um, okay, thanks. Um, this poem is called, How Can a Life Fit Into Two Cupped Hands? Standing in the middle of a pond, crumpled pages in my folded hands, I am trying to read my life. History is waterlogged. Pain's ink is smeared. Bleeding into the hazy water, bleeding like ancient ink, melted by sunlight. I stand in the murky water. Blood of remembrance stings like a paper cut. I flinch into stillness, attempt to mend the bleeding, cover the wound with soaked pages torn from my memoir. I hold my days in my hands. How can a life fit into two cupped hands? Water sifts through sentences, decides which to keep and which to dissolve. I swirl my hands in circumference just beneath the surface. Motion resurrects memory. Ripples mm -hmm. exhale from my body. I begin to spin. I am dizzy. I am not moving. I am in the middle of nowhere. I am frozen. Toes numb. This numbness cauterizes memory, stops the bleeding. I need to thaw, hold on to all the pages, bleed the pain like toxin, name it and let its written ink dissolve the debris that hinders fresh water from enfolding me. Then I can cleanse my way back to shore away from the hazy pond to a lake where my reflection sings welcome, my beloved, I see you. With promise of healing, deeper than shallow pools I was once told to wade in. They're safe, they're not safe. Wounds wake up in stagnant water, scream for salve, but depth is needed to heal, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. And now let's hear uh, another so uh, song, another, well, you can do a song and a poem, uh, Lois. Thank you, Dana. That was lovely. Um, so I'm gonna read this last poem and I connected with a guy in uh, Dubai who is a poet and a painter. And we just, you know, on Facebook, he would, uh, he would type a line, post a line in Arabic, and then I would translate it. And I would go, oh my God, this is beautiful. <laughs> you know, and I started seeing all these posts of his and I thought, it's just incredible, an incredible poet. So we got to know each other and I saw some of his paintings. Anyway, he surprised me a few years ago where he actually painted a portrait uh, of me and sent it to me. And so this is a poem called Ways to Paint a Woman. And um, it's after the portrait. 
Sometimes only color can speak for the heart. Sometimes you have to paint it yellow. Listen with the eyes, honeycomb in maze, golden rainflowers. Transform with your softest brush the way Lorca's bathing girl liquefies into water, half a head in fire, sun burning a trail from forehead to cheek. Graze the mouth with mango, make time to blend and take away. Use the green of a blind man when he says you're beautiful and means you're timeless. Show what the light gave her, washing warmth into a neck until it's dune, a cliffside that holds a head of surf. Paint as you would before you awaken. When sunlight falls like milkweed and you are an empty silo, letting her grain fill you, buttery malt and biscuit for the love of honey. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. So beautiful, Lois. Thank you. You have such amazing friends and because you take such care to nurture your friendships, Lois. I love my friends. I mean, look at you. You're this incredible, generous, nurturing, amazing woman. And I'm so very lucky to have you in my life. So I appreciate, I appreciate you and your gifts and your, and your generosity. Thank you. thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I will do a very short poem and maybe a song, and then I'd like Dan to close with a song, if that's okay with everybody, because he missed my beginning. So, um, you are the daughters of the king. You are the daughter of the king, my friend and teacher once told me. Do not let anyone crush your spirit. Walk tall, wear your beautiful smile and go on. I wish I had your courage. You are the daughter of the king. My father taught me that. For so long I had forgotten who I was, giving into everyone's needs and wants, everyone's schedules. I had forgotten until one day I threw guilt into the receding tide, claimed some time and gazed at the glistening ocean. Everything came back, warm breeze waiting there, the softest carpet laid at my feet, glorious music all around, an answer passed, royal welcome. You are the daughters of the king. Thank you all, thank you for coming and I'd like Dan Navarro to take us to dreamland. Well, I generally find that people like to listen to my music when they're having trouble sleeping. That's uh... <laughs> I thank you all for your time and attention, and Elena, I thank you for inviting me so much. Thank you. I'm so glad you made it. I did the in-person event once in Santa Monica. It's been some. It's been a few years now, um, but we got back in touch ex much recently because we were rem reminiscing about our mutual friend Susan Hayden's wedding to Steve Hockman, and uh, I think it's through Susan that I got back in touch with you after all those years. That's we right. We really did meet. I wrote February 1980 at the Alibi Club in the Kings Road. So I like to refer to this song as Fingerprints. It's not the title. I 
I dusted off my clothes Straightened out my nose Picked up my vanity Took it down the road with me Facts I could not erase Exploded in my face What I could not repair I just left lying there Between the darkness and the light There's only shades of gray Tomorrow's so far from my sight And I don't believe in yesterday I don't believe in yesterday Tidal waves that I ignored They washed me overboard The patterns that I reject well, They're all twisted and circumspect Between the darkness and the light there's only shades of gray Tomorrow's so far from my sight And I don't believe in yesterday I don't believe in yesterday Now here's to all the alibis That pulled me through the worst of times It was all convenient memory Rewriting history So say goodbye to way back when all that might have been No, it doesn't matter why or how They don't mean nothing now Between the darkness and the light There's only shades of gray Tomorrow so far from my sight And I don't believe in yesterday No, I don't believe in yesterday No, I don't believe in yesterday No, I don't believe in yesterday Thank you so Beautiful. very much for having me, and everybody was so wonderful tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Part of this. That was so beautiful. So beautiful. Oh, great. Thank, Thank you, Dan. You. Very beautiful. Well, now we see Stephanie. Chico. Thank you, Dan. 
Did she go on camera finally? Let me actually see. I'm taking a look. <laughs> Stephanie's from my my friend from uh, Kansas City, Missouri. She's a part of the folk community. We've known each other for about five years, and uh, I invited her to come down. Good to see Thank you. Thank you. You too. And she Thank hung you. out till the bitter end, and she's two time zones away. <laughs> Only one thirty in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Venice, so not not Italy, unfortunately, but. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Anna. Come, come again, come again, and uh... every third Friday, right? This is awesome. <laughs> Please make sure to send me invitations. I appreciate okay. that. Okay, we'll do. Good night. Much Good love night. to everybody, and you were all wonderful. And thank you so very much. And I'm nice to meet you all that I haven't thank met. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Sorry about your trouble early on. I don't you know, know what happened. I switched browsers and it worked. So there's some, ah. and I had done three previous zooms today. Um, um, taught a class, did an interview, and had a, a very technical meeting with the Mechanical Licensing Collective or something like that. So anyway, thank you all. I thank really you. Thank it. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, Armand. Good See night. Good night. Good night. Such a beautiful. Thank you, Delia. Thank you. Thank you, Ilana. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Dana. Thank, thank you, Elena. Thank you, Jim. So glad you came. So good to see these faces again. Oh. Thank you. And thank you for sticking up politically. <laughs> thank you to some of our friends. <clears throat> thank you, Eva, Eva. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Love the painting. All right. What a, what a delightful, wonderful evening it was. Thank you. This is just I mean, so enriching. Lo Lois has assembled like the creme de la creme here. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> honestly. This is well, a lot of your people here. A lot of your people. And you know, you you really created something wonderful. I mean, you already had it in person, but now you have something different and mm -hmm. warm and reaching it on Zoom. So you, you've done that, you know, it's beautiful. Yeah, Elena, thank you for keeping this going on Zoom. You know, it's also appreciative for sure. It's the only reading I go to. <laughs> so, I mean, I go to, you know, I do workshops or class or whatever, but as far as poetry readings, I just love your reading, and I just—it's just. Well, I, it's I'm good really all honored. The time. Thank you. You know Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. <clears throat> no. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoy listening to you, Karen. You and Dion are just gifts. Oh, thank you. I see the moon, Susan. Oh, thank I you. took that picture for you, Lynn. <laughs> thank you. That was no. actually yesterday. I don't know what to do with the people that are like, the names are still here, but I know they've left, like Alexis. <laughs> I'm not like to. It's just, well, just check you can now. See the participants, if you click on that, you can just see who's here. So I don't know whatever those names are, but you can see who's on the, you know, it shows like even if somebody wasn't on video, their name would show. Yeah, I know, but that's- Oh, a, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. They, they, I think they left, but they left the sound on. Sometimes they go to sleep and. <laughs> yes. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So, are we all going to have sweet dreams tonight and I hope so. I hope fall asleep? So. And, and we're just going to love our pillow so much. Our pillow is our best friend. Most certainly. Our pillow. <laughs> I'm already on my pillow. <laughs> Good for you. Not that other guy's pillow. Never. Oh no. By the way, his pillows, I've seen his pillows. They are horrible. They're like shredded pieces of foam rubber. <laughs> you know, and they and it smells terrible. And <laughs> that is totally unappealing. Very awful. I've had my pillow for I think thirty five or forty years. Really? That's amazing. Well, they don't make pillows like that anymore. All of the pillows are memory foam, and you sink into it, and you can't breathe. 
And so, yeah, you know. Funny. How I, did you keep a pillow for that long without it falling apart? I I have two pillows stuffed in one pillowcase. Okay. Oh. Excuse me. I, I just found out how to record specific bits. Oh. So when you oh, go to great. A, somebody's name. Yeah. Next to ask to unmute is more. Yeah. So the more you scroll down, say allow to record. Yes, now, yes. Next time. Oh, Next time. great. That's wonderful. Yeah. Because I was, okay. So the people that are not here anymore, I can just remove, right? How do you know they're not here? Well, because they, they haven't spoken, so. <laughs> Like <laughs> Alexis, you know, I mean, not that we're talking about her, but I mean, she's. Maybe they're shy. No, no. <laughs> she's, she's probably asleep hours ago. So I'll just remove Alexis. I'm going to have nightmares about this. I'm going to have nightmares that I was removed. Oh, no. <laughs> just like, like, like by okay. the punch of a button. No, because if, if, you just, if you remove this, like you, you they say, do you report to Zoom? No, I don't want to report anybody to Zoom. <laughs> no, it, no, no, it just, it, it, it literally, it's, I, I bet I'm going to have a nightmare about this. And if I do, I'm going to tell you. Oh, okay. Well, keep I was posted. disappeared. <laughs> Give me posted. Shrink. <laughs> well, people, people you are at move. home, so you can understand them falling asleep sometimes. That's right. Well, we, we have those soothing voices that we have. Yeah, I mean, yes. I say this in person, but like right now, there's no, there's no way I could have driven from Santa Monica home as tired as I am tonight. So I'm really glad to be in my bedroom. <laughs> Yeah, and I see your pillows. I see your puffy little pillows there. <laughs> they look wonderful. Oh. This is my pillow. Oh. I don't know if you could see it. The sky. Pillow. It looks like the sky with the moon is your pillow. That's what yeah, we see. That's the, the sky with my moon is my pillow. But also, I have a I have a cat pillow. It's hard to see because it's dark. Oh. It's a it's a pillow that's in the shape of a cat. Oh. My best pillow is my dog's rump. <laughs> Your dog is so cute. That's my best pillow. Thank you all. I hope you had fun, um, Lois. Oh, I did. It was great. It was great. So many different voices. And, um, yeah. All your I don't think I've ever had, had everybody on two pages. There were two full pages. <laughs> Yeah. I hope I covered everybody. It was great. And um, I loved hearing everybody. And uh, I think I'm going to pass out right now. Me too. <laughs> Good night. Going, going. Good night, going. Karen. Good night. Good night, Dana. Good night, everyone. Jim, it's Good great night. to Good night, see you. All. Good night. Good night, Jim, Jim. I haven't seen you since Moon Day on the Palisades when you came to the Pacific Palisades. Oh my gosh. Wow. Right? And those were such potent readings, such yeah. concentrated readings. Yeah, yeah. We High packed calibers. it all into that little room. Yeah, Alice, um, Alice created something just so. <sighs> Like I said, just so concentrated yeah. and, and potent with such caliber of poetry there. I loved it. Miss it. Yeah. I'm going to stop recording. I okay. didn't realize I was still recording. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>